the problem with non-self. Many people when they begin to encounter the deeper concepts of Buddhism and of the Buddha's teaching and of where the path actually is leading to, uh, many people start to examine the concept of the third uh, aspect of tilakana. Tilakana means ti or tri ti. Th three. Lakana means uh, properties. Uh, I think that's properties on a right click on a computer. Yes. The, pro the three. Con I call them three conditions. I prefer to call them three conditions. In official Buddhism, I think I'm not sure what they call. <laughs> Namely, anichang uh, tukang anatta anichang anicca. Anicca is uh, impermanence. All things are subject to impermanence. Try and find a thing which is not impermanent. This should be the mission of. Uh, analytical meditation or, or contemplative meditation not analytical Medita meditation is never analytical it, analysis comes after it should be contemplative so one contemplates in stillness of mind the tilakana all dhammas while studying the dhamma and practicing the dhamma which means contemplating the truth of the matter into its deepest depths within you and in the world around you and in your own experience. If you can find the dhammas or the truths, the way way things are which the Buddha d described, and check them out. And this is why he said, Bajatang Vetitapo Vinyohiti, something like, I don't translate through, I translate doyat. Doyat in Thai means uh, not a literal translation, but the true meaning. Sometimes this another language won't use the same word or verb for that context, and I find direct translation a matter for academics. I am not an, an academic in that sense; rather, I am an autodidact. I am self-taught and uh, self-intuited. I find my own answers which is what the Buddha taught, do not believe because it is in a book, don't believe because your guru said it, don't believe because your teacher said it, your mom said it, or everybody else believes it, or society says it's not true. You believe when you find in your experience that it is valid and that it is true in its context and it is useful, then you should take it and absorb it into your life and apply it to your life that it may enrich in your life. These are the only dhammas which should be believed. The Buddha warned about this again and again because um, superstition and gullibility, which means people believe easily, is rife. It was rife back then and it's still rife now. <laughs> so, non-self is the main topic <coughs> of this dhamma talk. I hope I deserve to call it that. Which it always when one. No, that's for another day. I promise I will do. A, can I teach Dhamma? This is another question people ask me. I've been going for a while, and I would like to spread it, but I don't know everything yet. Another day we'll talk about that. But right now, uh, I'm going to go back to the main topic, which is non-self and the problem with non-self, if there is any at all. And why people have a problem, why people discuss, and people have been discussing this for 2,500 years, and bhikkhus have been, fr um, in an auspicious way, in details, arguing about this, We're having dhamma wars, we have dhamma discussions, it's part of what a bhikkhu should do, sit and have discourse, in order to discover and uncover one's wrong views, and to find higher views, and advance along the path to open one's eye to see new dhammas which reveal the truth and open the worlds. Bird lok, open the worlds, lift the veils. Which are bird lok, the which are to lift the veils and remove the dust from our eyes and to see 
the true nature of all things as they truly are, universal nature of things as all creation is in truth, not as we purport it to be or as our senses or our mind as it is conditioned through those senses is to be. This is part of having five khandhas, this is part of tilakana, of being anicca impermanent, clinging to impermanence, bringing dukkha, suffering, and anatta, non-self, which is the problem we deal with in this talk. So, in order to understand non-self <coughs> properly, so one does not have to sit and argue, I'd like to go through a few things. Before that, I'd just like to say where it leads later, because when we begin the Buddhist path, sometimes I, I laugh now these days because, you know, when I ended the Buddhist path, if I had known then where it was going to lead, but had not known why it is a joy, and had just known the transformation that lay before and lies before me, I don't think I would have wanted it because one still possesses very much of a, a false view or a, one has ignorance of ignorance. You see, the ego would take offense at this word. Excuse me, this is a bad word to use for Dhamma. In this case, one should never refer to uh, people, even in general, as those who can do this and can't do that, or those who are ignorant and those who are this or those, because it splits people apart, causes schisms and it causes emotions to arise, uh, dissent. So I gave the wrong word, I apologize. Um, yes, maybe I'll get into this another day. Uh, anatta, non-self. Mm, we have to study the five khandhas. Where it will lead to later is the Paditya Samabhada, which is dependent origination and the, which is the, the cycle of rebirth, a never-ending rebirth in samsara, samsara, uh, what a tag, a never-ending wheel of illusory existence, which is subject to impermanence, anicca, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness of impermanence, therefore suffering, because we cling to those impermanent things. And lastly, the third one, anatta, non-self. All things are not self. All things, no thing has a self. There is no thing which has a fixed, unchanging, eternal, undying thing which is a self. But it does have a thing, which is not anything you could call a self, and that is what is never added in any teaching or argument I have heard. Um, perpetual motion is something uh, English speakers know. Perpetual motion is uh, the attempt to make a machine or, you know, these metal balls on the executive desk that hit each other and keep going for a long time. Uh, all these mobiles that will go for a long time, a glass bird that drinks water from a bowl and keeps dipping its head in. A perpetual motion machine, but of course because of the friction of uh, the atmosphere even, even a rocket in space, you switch off the rocket at 5, 000, 5 million kilometers an hour, you will keep going at 5 million kilometers an hour, it will take you lifetimes to slow down, because there's a vacuum, there's no friction, unless you hit a rock or a meteor of course. But, um, so, you know, nothing, nothing is completely in, uh, permanent. So, um, the mind cannot be said to see this. Say, if the mind is a self, it says the self is my mind. I have myself. I believe the self is my mind. Okay. Let's say, assume it's true. So my mind... Mm -hmm. What am I thinking now? What are you thinking? Well, okay. Just before I asked you, what were you thinking? Something else, no? And by this time you'll be already experiencing a new bubble of thought passing, arising, and as it arises, the one you were thinking has disappeared. It's gone. 
It's completely gone. It's empty. It was never there. As if it was never there. You have memory. You have sanya. Sanya is memory. Uh, when you perceive something, even if you're actually what you're seeing and hearing now is memory. One, because I already made this recording, so in a physical sense, in an outer space, outside uh, the illusion of outside, you sense. But also in another sense, in a more abstract sense, if you can figure that out. So, to continue, this more abstract part is, of course, the mind. Every thought, it's impermanent. And so, consciousness, when we think about things, it is because we are conscious of something. And uh, when we become conscious of it, we then proliferate uh, because of our kandas, for example, mm, our senses, memory. You smell something that reminds you when you were a child and it reminds you of something good or bad and your memory arises. This is consciousness. Consciousness arises. This is in a later talk about Baditya Samabhadda, the dependent origination and the, the, the academic splitting of it into twelve links, twelve notions, <laughs> which are for me empty but unnecessary notions to use. They're limited notions which help us to understand and something that is very unlimited. Unfortunately, they seem to design it as a cycle or a circle. It has a circular kind of effect, but it is not, and it does not have a beginning point of the twelve stages they make, nor an end. But there is something happening between them that causes our misfortune to be born and reborn and reborn in samsara, and have to suffer the Four Noble Truths, which are that you're born, you get old, you get sick, suffer, die, lose everything, have to fear of loss, have to suffer many loss of relatives, loss of many things, health and dukkha, unsatisfactory, it's impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, it is not self, we do not own it, it is beyond our control, my health is beyond my control, my health is not myself, my, my car it will not always be shiny and red, it will get a flat tire, somebody might scratch it, a vandal or my, my life, my health my beauty, my youth, my happiness, my good mood, the way I feel right now, and whatever. This party won't last forever, as I say. And so, uh, all this tilakina, uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, which leads to dukkha, to suffering, because of that impermanence, and not, there is no thing that is perpetuates as a self because the self or what one would call a self if Buddhists would be flexible enough to allow both the words self and non-self to exist this is what my, one of my favorite ajans, ajan cha hmm? Also looks at Lumpur Man of uh, another monk. I just made a biography of of Lumpur Simpali, which you can find on my SoundCloud podcast at soundcloud.com slash Thailand amulets. Anyway, that's the marketing. Um, so nothing perpetuates. Uh, you could say that oh, Ajahn Spencer, he is a smiling fellow. Well. You never see me get out of the wrong side of the bed in the morning, you know. Uh, nobody is like this or like that all of the time. We do have qualities, but those qualities, they change and they fluctuate. And um, that's part of dukkha, part of the suffering of transience, of impermanence. Uh, it's also what one of the sufferings of humans as in the six 
In Tibetan Buddhism, they explain six realms of samsara, well, of six realms of different kinds of beings who are caught in the realm of becoming, in the Vatachaka, in the, in the Vatachak, the wheel, cycle of rebirth, the wheel of time, impermanence, endless, no respite. One of the sufferings of the humans is um, in these six worlds, the animals suffer from something, the Asura, jealous gods, suffer from something, even though they have power and riches and they live for eons, even the gods, even the gods, for that which the Buddha points toward, which I like to call the far shore when I feel poetic. But uh, that which Buddhism calls Nipana, Nipan, Pranipan in Thai, Pranipan, Paranipana, into the gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond, beyond, gone beyond even conceiving of that which can be gone beyond. I quote Baba Ramdas. Google it. So our experience is perpetual, like the perpetual motion machine we spoke about in the first part of this talk, about non the problem with non-self. And uh, I always used to argue when we had these arguments, I was ordained when we would sit and really, really chew bones on it as bhikkhus in the, in the evening. It's when we never slept much. You only just sleep one or two hours a day, really. There's no respite as a bhikkhu either. And this was part of the lesson. You have five kandas, you are born. One of the sufferings of the humans is incessant action. And, I like to say in Spanish, uh, la ausencia de... Uh, la autocarencia, the, the absence of the uh, feeling of completion. That if you've got your house and you want a garden, if you've got a garden and you want a swimming pool, you've got a swimming pool, you want a new car, you've got a new car, you want a better car. And you put the, the instinct, which is also evolutionary instinct to survive and to expand, which causes us to evolve, it's evolution. That's how we discovered sciences and all this other. Go pretty deeply into that another day. Um, it's natural. That is why what the Buddha did is unnatural. Magic is natural. It is a science. It is a vitya in Sanskrit, uh, in Makata. Uh, Makot, Pasaha, Makot, uh, Makata Sanskrit, which was the language of the Buddha before they made uh, Pasaha Bali or Pali Sanskrit later in Sri Lanka which was some time after the Buddha, I don't know when they made that after the Buddha's leaving, so that they could write down the, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, academia, academia. What is important is the heart of Dhamma and insight into touching and feeling the heart of Dhamma and knowing how to find it in yourself because nobody else is going to be able to reveal it to you except yourself within your own mind, nothing else, everything you experience, all that happens to us, all of our experience arises in our own minds. When we see a sinner and think he is sinful, the sin exists in our mind, not in that of the sinner. The sinner is oblivious to that which we conceive of as sin. And we experience a kusala dhammada through uh, inauspicious phenomena, inauspicious thing, inauspicious dhamma. All things are dhammas. If you can listen to another talk I made about what is the dhamma, you can find on YouTube on my channel. Mm. What does the word dhamma mean? Yeah, the word dhamma it was called. So, it's an inauspicious dhamma in the mind of he, of the righteous, feel, righteous assuming person who watches another practitioner 
in the temple when they stay, there's a lay practitioner hanging around. A hang if you're in a motorbike club, you'd be a hang around, not a member. So you are white, you're not a bhikkhu. Uh, you have this kind of hierarchy. If you're paranoid or your ego has that kind of uh, mind process, then you will feel like that. If it doesn't, then you'll be a lot better off. But it happens to a lot of people on a lesser or greater extent, staying in temples, especially the first few times. So one goes to practice and uh, one finds oneself critical watching others. And when one watches others and is criticizing in one's heart or mind, one is not practicing the five precepts. They're only doing it with body and the white cloth. If the mind is still killing and the heart is still killing, then, uh, excuse me, then the precepts are not held. So some people say to me, I go to see... I go to the temple for three days to practice wear white and I come out, I feel really good. I always say, you know, either then you really have been practicing well for a long time or you did not practice and you did not look at what you were supposed to be looking at. Because if you had wore white and, you know, felt good and, then, you know, just picked up on the good vibes of the temple and the nice chanting and the flowers and the Buddha statues everywhere, which the Buddha actually forbade to make imagery of him, because then it would make us cling to Rupa Dhamma. He did not allow my hater, He doesn't let you. If you are one of his bhikkhus and you are practicing, then he does not allow in his practice to let oneself fall into fascination or into seeking temporary pleasure, because temporary pleasures are part of what leads us into endless suffering, clinging to those. They do not provide an ultimate release, they just leave one wanting more again later. You know, if you smoke cigarettes, you know. If you've ever been addicted to drugs, you know. If you've ever been addicted to sex, you know. If you've ever been addicted to um, Buddhism as an academic, you know. That one can lose oneself in the role one thinks one plays. And Rupa Dhamma is not something that the Buddha recommended. There again, he also used Rupa Dhammas as primary focus objects when he taught the first ten of his forty vipassana, 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 gamatan, gamatana techniques of insight and mindfulness meditation. The first ten teachings were the gasin, the gasina, the tasa gasina. Uh, which were basically focusing primarily on outer objects, which were mainly yantra, or symbols you made, which were relevant to the four, four five, or six elements, depending on your practice, and staring at them. This is very recommendable, in fact, for those who find it hard to close their eyes and abstractly just use a kata chant. And without their eyes, their minds wander. So to still the mind and learn how the feeling is of a still mind, first using an outer object to stare at is very good. It's excellent. In Thailand, they've removed these from the practices. Most temples do not teach it, even when you're ordained. Only magicians, most of them are a lot of lay practitioners, might. And so monks who do it will do it because they learned it when they were a Buddhist, or they learned it when they were a lay practitioner. So magic is worldly. Uh, it's a vitya or vicha in Thai it means like science or craft art. The arts and crafts is a science and there is uh, a certain scientific and also spiritual aspect to it which allows it to manifest if one is lucky enough to uh, discover behind all of the fakery and the fantasy that it really exists and how it can be controlled. The Rishi, the Rishi, they do their yogic practices, they discover these and through doing the Gasin Sip, the Ten Gasinas also, it causes the Itipadas, the four powers to arise. and leads towards the apinya powers afterwards with purity of practice, which are the six powers leading to arahantship. You can't get to arahantship without passing through all of these. 
anyway, so uh, seeking power in itself is not the path to enlightenment, but unfortunately along the path to enlightenment it's going to happen anyway. So there's a danger you might fall into some thinking you're Superman when you find this, you have psychic powers and you can read minds or you see the future or you can tell people what's going to happen and some people make a profession out of it watch out for these this is against the god cruel against the law of the guru yeah, like as Ajahn forbade his books to be sold he said uh, the Dhamma is not something I think it was Lungta Mahabua the Dhamma is not something to be sold in a market price it's just to be given free for the Buddha has uh, decreed that Dhamma, to give the gift of Dhamma is the supreme gift of all gifts that you can give somebody because the Dhamma can liberate them from samsara and it is the ultimate medicine and the ultimate bliss that is knows no end not a temporary excitement or satisfaction which we seek like I just spoke about if you smoke cigarettes you'd know addiction it's one of the Chain, links in the chain of the Paditya Samabhada, the dependent origination, the chain of rebirth into the Vatachaka, the endless wheel of samsara, illusory, wrong view. We're here because of one wrong view. So, non self. If you understand non self, one has to look for a permanent, unchanging, non transient part within one's five, five khandas which I shall list shortly and I think I'll give a different separate complete talk on it they call them skandhas as well sounds good here I call them khandas because I translate my Buddhist r spelling of words and my p the way I spell and will speak Pali it will be very Thai influenced so if you're interested in Thai Buddhism or ordaining and wishing to know the terminology and how to pronounce things here, how to chant, etc., you're best off listening to me. But if you want to do it really as it really was and is in Sri Lanka and as it was in India, then you're probably better listening to Sri Lankan monks chanting. Because uh, I do, I pronounce it as we do here in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, non-self, we need to look at the five khandas. What are the five khandas? Rup, Vitana, Sanya, Sankhan, Minyan, Rup, Rupa, form, the body, physical materiality, shape, <coughs> Vitana, Vitana is feelings, emotions, maybe reaction, first reaction, first proliferation. Mm. I'll come back to this when I hit the last one, which is Vinyan. Vitana. Third one is Sanya. Perception. That word is normally not used, I use it. Memory. Sanya is memory. Sanya, the word Sanya in Thai, which is related to Sanskrit, and to Pali, well, to Pali, modern Sanskrit, um, means, you can use it in a modern sense to say, uh, um, Sanya means, no, no, we won't get into that. No. <coughs> Sanya is memory. Now, you can say, well, how can memory be perception, too? It can be perception because by the time I have thought and spoke something, even though it's very fast, it takes a minuscule split moment of a second to reach your ear and for you to process it. Which means that just as when you look at a star explode that is 500 light years away, is a star which has not existed since 500 years and the explosion you are viewing already happened 500 years ago you are viewing the past in the present in such a case in the same sense as we are speaking now or as I am talking and you are listening in this case then well 
it's already happened. By the time you get to know about it, it's already happened. Because <coughs> the time is short, <coughs> maybe you can still affect some, react and influence something. I suppose that's traveling in time, then you can reach back in time just a little bit enough to keep hold of it and realize the situation or solve the situation. How about that? Time is not certain either. How big is a moment? And what separates a moment from the other moment? And what separates one thought from the next when one fades away and gives way to the next? Whatever it is, it's the only quality which I could name it for using Nama Dhamma names. Yeah, is, what do you think? Well, that name is Anatta, non-self. It has no particular self. It has nothing that be called, nothing in particular about it that can be called self. For it perpetuates itself without any such need. It is empty. It is pure unstained, it is birthless and deathless. It is that which I have come to know as the over-self. That is my personal word, my personal way. Everybody has to have their personal ways. It's just a word. People make religions out of a word or a way of thinking of things. And actually, you know, that's where a wrong view comes in. Uh, one of my masters, one of my earliest masters, and still who I respect so much, is Lama Ringo Tuku Rinpoche, who is one of the four Tukus who uh, protect the Kamapa and who will return to find him in his re in reincarnations. Uh, I was lucky enough to know Ringo Tuku and to receive teachings from him on various occasions in retreats before I came to Thailand and people assumed me to be a Theravada Buddhist. I'm not even a Buddhist because Buddhism is completely imaginary but it's necessary up to a point and the only way I have found on this planet which I could point to and recommend and say this way this is how I found how to see things and how I will find my Nibbana how I will find uh, liberation from suffering so uh, this is the only gift I really have to leave the world with when I die, so I suppose that's why I'm doing it. So non-self is not something that is not, it is something that is. Nibbana, Nirvana is not something that is not, it is something that is. But it is not something in particular. That would be limited then, wouldn't it? If it was a frog or if it was um, a mood like this. You know, if we had the same mood all the time. Uh, for humans, they'd say that's like a robot or something. Uh, it's not about stopping the constant flow of the ocean, the ebb and the tide. It's about going with the flow of the ocean and the ebb and the tide. And I think, who knows, you know, who's not an Arahant? Can you teach about the mind of an Arahant? Well, actually, there are teachings about the minds of the four or eight kinds of enlightened persons, uh, about how the mind would be, but also in your own practice and meditation, one can temporarily, temporarily enter states which, although one comes back from and doesn't see or think it, so clearly anymore. One can remember the mood and how it was. So that's like a preview. So sometimes uh, with jhana and other uh, experiences of vipassana, which correlate maybe in vetana and upasana, when in the Fosatipatthana, as you look at first your body, it's about 50 practices or something, then you look at your feelings, then you look at your jitta, your mind, then you look at the dhamma, you look at all the dhamma, all phenomena. But first we start with the five khandhas, 
and I recommend for to understand the problem. If you still hear this talk and you don't understand at least theoretically, if not with insight, you will have to contemplate to receive the insight. Nobody receives insight and becomes enlightened to a, any Dhamma without contemplating it with sati. Sampachanya and panya sati means um, co collectedness. Sampachanya means effort to maintain one's collectedness and focus. And panya, well, that arises when you do that. It is wisdom. It means uh, you've got sense in your head. You haven't lost the plot. You haven't lost it. You are seeing things clearly. Your mind is still. And you are able to contemplate the Dhamma for as it is. For you have not let your mind be conditioned by mood or fluctuation of view. You're just sitting still and stopping naming things and letting things be. And it's part of letting go, letting go of clinging. Meditation teaches us to do this because to meditate one has to let go. So letting go is another one for another talk, another day. Study the five candles and study the three conditions I call tilakana <coughs> of the impermanence anicca, dukkha and anatta <coughs> and think you can maybe listen to a talk I made which uh, I can recommend you a talk which was about the space what lies between things perhaps I shall make a new talk on that I would like to talk more about that I asked what lies between a thought and the next thought what lies between one feeling and the next and I didn't finish that before I go and what lies between me and you what lies between the speaker and the hearer the he who meant it and he who understood what was meant was the same thing understood for sure I think we can conclude yes uh, how does that happen what transmits what is transmitted between all those things which are empty in themselves is a word a vehicle with a meaning sat inside it driving between my mouth and your ear no 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 it's a total haze of frequencies of uh, particles if you studied quantum physics and subatomic particle theory then uh, microscopic level then uh, you would see that there is no such thing as rupa, as a, as a real form. All forms are just clouds made of forms, smaller, tiny forms, which are also so it's infinite. So actually there's no such thing as matter. But it doesn't matter. We're still here, or we seem to be. And that's the important thing. So, non-self, don't let it bother you. You're here, you're still here. And if you're enlightened, you'll still be here. Or if you're not here, it's because you you died already. And if you're enlightened, you won't be coming back again. So don't worry about that either. <coughs> and uh, that's it on non-self. Five candas and tilakana, those three conditions. Study them, contemplate them when you meditate. Do anapanasati, breathing, exercise and focus. Once your mind is still, contemplate these dhammas, your five candas. And are they subject to the three laws of tilakana, are they impermanent, can they lead to eventual suffering, and do they have a self, or are they yourself? Do it with your body, cut off your toe and say, was that me, I'm still here, so what's my toe now to me? That's asupapavana. You can do it with your feelings, you can do it with your thoughts. You can do it with uh, your perception, what you're perceiving now is not what you're perceiving a minute ago, what you smell now is not what you were smelling a minute ago. Watch it moving, it's like a cork in a storm on the ocean, you're like a boat on the ocean, a captain without a rudder, moving from one emotion to the next, one instinct to the next, go get a Mars bar from the fridge, change your mind when you open it because you saw some peanuts and something reminded you of something and the next thing it's influenced you to take those peanuts, think about that contemplate those things and uh, I wish you all really well and hope that the Dhamma finds all of you well and that it watches over you 